Tim from the New Evangelicals. Thank you so One much. One of the most infamous <laughs> people in the in the space. Put another way, right? A lot of churches, I hear this all the time from pastors, they blame everyone but themselves for what's happening in America. Most of those churches that I know of are not affirming. They are pretty much fundamentalism in disguise. I would say since the AIDS crisis, evangelical Christians have been the cruelest people towards the community. I think people are just tired of being like dismissed as fill in the blank phobia. I'm pointing you to Romans one and you're going, uh, I don't really know. I right. don't understand that though, because like we have, you know, we know that people who are affirmed in their sexuality can live healthy, human flourishing, content lives with a partner of the same sex long term. Someone should have the right to live however they want, whatever they do in the privacy of their own home versus saying that person has to be affirmed in every aspect of that, or you're a homophobe. Besides it sounding as shocking as it sounds, there yeah. really isn't a good logical argument to make to defend that though. You, you don't like that, that makes you uncomfortable. Of course it does. Okay. I mean, this is this is the abolition move. This is, this is welcome to Christian nationalism, so, bro. So what is Bruce Lawn? In this podcast, we talked about every single hot topic issue going on in culture today. And as you can imagine, we said a lot of things that would get us ethered in the YouTube algorithm and probably violated a couple of community guidelines. So if you're the type of person that wants to see the full, uncensored, four and a half hour long version of this conversation, sign up on Patreon for as little as $5 a month to get access to all of our podcasts. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special treat for you today. This is someone that I have a lot of amazing conversations with offline. Uh, he is a fun hang, and he does some very interesting work with the New Evangelicals. And I'm extremely excited to hear more of his story, but also get into fully understanding some of the communities that he represents so that as I'm navigating these spaces that we don't straw man and we really get a good gauge of where people are at. And I'm sure there'll be some fun disagreements in this conversation. But ladies and gentlemen, we have Tim from the New Evangelicals. Oh, thank you so One much. One of the most infamous <laughs> people in the in the space. Infamous. Oh, infamous man. in the space of uh, what, what would we call christen them online? Yeah, sure. If you will. Um, <laughs> And yeah, man, it, it's it, it's been fun hanging out with you. We went yeah. to dinner last night, which was great. Yeah, um, I've been following your content for years. Uh, probably 2020 is when I first stumbled across your stuff. We started in December 2020, so you're probably yeah. pretty close that to was the very beginning. early. Yeah. yeah, very early. And um, yeah, man, it's 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 been interesting to see that. And then also, I feel like I have certain folks in my in my life who I have really good offline conversations with that I can kind of bounce ideas off of. And, you're, and you've always been very, very gracious and not like uh, offended when I like challenge you on something. So I'm like, man, that's, it's good. And so I think there's a lot of obviously conversations around progressive Christianity, mm -hmm. around deconstruction, deconversion. Yeah. And you're in a lot of these spaces. And what I don't want to do is speak about people from a echo chamber. Right. Right. And yeah. so I think it's much better to speak with people, speak to people, um, regardless on, on where they're at. Uh, we were joking yesterday how we had, you know, I had Joe, Joe Webin on last month, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you were, you found that astonishing. Oh, and I'm like, my jaw dropped. Well, <laughs> Holy you know, moly, now we have you on, you know, <laughs> so we, we go from Joe Webin, who's Christian nationalist vibes to Tim from the New Evangelicals, who's, uh, I don't know, I don't know how you would even classify yourself. Anti-Christian nationalist. Anti-Christian <laughs> He's the response to the Christian nationalist. Okay, yeah. so before we get into some of that stuff, for folks who don't know you, I don't know a whole lot about, like, your personal story. Like, yeah. I know you were, you know, uh, 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 homeschool. I knew you grew up Christian. Yep. And I know you run the New Evangelicals. I know you're yeah. married. You got two beautiful kids, beautiful wife. That's about as much as I know about you. Mm. So mm -hmm. for folks who don't know anything about you, give us a little bit of, of your background and kind of like how you got into this space. Yeah, I'll give you some of the cliff notes and we can unpack whatever you sure. want as we, we go through it. But yeah, I mean, I grew up in the evangelical Christian tradition. That is all I've ever known. Okay. I was homeschooled for nine years. I grew up in a very like John MacArthur theology, okay. uh, that kind of world. So uh, so. Calvinist, yeah, definitely Calvinist. Okay. Uh, you know, inerrancy. Um, you okay. know, the the, the High Bible, view of scripture. Yeah, gotcha. uh, uh, yeah. I would say almost like a. It wasn't said this explicitly, but the impression was, "Hey, God just beamed down this book that we call the Bible. So just read it, and you'll be okay. It's God's word to us." In that kind of context, in, in a very 
hyper literal sense. Definitely hyper literal. Okay. You know, uh, six day creation. You know, evolution is definitely garbage. That kind of thing. Okay. So I grew up that way. Uh, my parents got saved later on in life. They kind of went from one extreme to the other. So I get that. You know, I what told extreme you, did they go from? Well, my my dad was more you know in like the rock and roll lifestyle for okay. a while, and um, you know there there was stuff like that. My mom grew up, I think, more Catholic. Okay. And uh, she got saved, and they met at at, at a church, and okay. that's how they got together. So I grew up in honestly, my parents were ama- still are amazing people. People, a very mm-hmm. loving household. You know, um, a lot of people I talked to do not have the same experience, but my childhood was overwhelmingly happy. Mm. Um, and I was serving in church in some capacity since the beginning. I mean, I was literally eight years old uh, in a suit and tie in my little um, non denominational Baptist church, handing out bulletins to people. Mm. Uh, and that's all I knew. Wow. So I have always been someone since the beginning who was always committed to being a Christian as, Mm -hmm. as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started playing drums in the church at age 11. Okay. Um, the church was hymns only, and we got a new pastor who was, you know, a hip, little more hip of a and hippie. Cool. Yeah. And what want... what uh, region of the world, uh, country is this? Oh, yeah, New Jersey. New Jersey-ish yeah. area? Yeah, uh-huh. And that, and you've lived kind of in that same whole proximity life. whole life? Yeah. In the same area? Okay. Yeah. And then you are serving at eight? I was, yeah, handing out bulletins at eight years old in the church. How big was the church? Oh, I mean, it had to be a couple hundred people. A couple yeah, hundred it was, people. So not it was a mega church, no, 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 but no. not like... Uh, um, uh, strip mall, two fifty, three hundred people, maybe. Okay. Yeah, pretty good size. Yeah, church. it was decent sized church. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that's my best recollection. Of, you know, that long sure. ago, but it felt like there were a lot of people there. Okay. Um, yeah, so I started playing drums in the church, and, and my dad, who again was a rock and roller, was like, "Ooh, we can we can bring some modern praise choruses in now." Mm-hmm. So songs like you know the good old faithful shout to the lords mm-hmm. and stuff. And my dad thought, "Well, if we want to get drums on the stage, how do we do it without like offending people?" Mm-hmm. Oh, my eleven year old son. We'll just throw him on stage. It'll like, be cute. <laughs> it'll be cute. <laughs> and my, my first ever drum set, it had the word, I'm not kidding, radical on the bass drum. Yeah. So my dad's like, well, we're going to duct tape that <laughs> so we don't offend anyone. Wow. So you know, I just started playing drums. And again, just as I grew up and got older, yeah. youth group, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I did all this stuff. I never rebelled. I was okay. not. My story is not one of like, I fell away and came back to the faith. Sure. I was always a Christian. Yeah. I and this is ni- 90s or late 80s? Uh, I'm 34, so like, uh, yeah, late 90s, late 90s you know, okay. ish, okay. Uh, 2000s. And I was totally swept up in the evangelical Christian subculture. Okay. I discovered uh, heavier music that was Christian, you know, bands like Blindside, mm-hmm. Under Oath, bands mm-hmm. I still like today. Uh, P.O.D. was maybe the most mainstream version of that. Mm-hmm. All playing drums, and and that was kind of my teenage years. Mm-hmm. I got involved with the parachurch ministry called Child Evangelism Fellowship. Hmm. Uh, they're they're the biggest boys and girls missions organization in the world. Okay. Uh, they do these things in New Jersey, or really nationwide, called five-day clubs. And as a teenager, you would raise your own support like a missionary. Okay. You would go to this training school thing in your local state, mm-hmm. and you would teach these almost like vacation Bible school type things mm-hmm. that were an hour-long program in someone's backyard. I did that from age 14 to almost 20. Okay. So again, all in, committed to the way of Jesus, wanted to own my faith and take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then long story short, when I was 18, this is where I really started to rethink some things, but not in the deconstruction way. Okay. Uh, I took a long-term mission trip overseas. I was in Europe for three months. Wow. I was in Belgium, Finland, and Germany for a month in each country. Okay. And I was also part of this really unique like young adults group that wasn't part of a church. It was our own thing. Mm-hmm. And um, we went to, I'm in Finland, and my buddy who's doing this trip with me is like, hey, man, heads up, uh, we're going to a church in Brussels, and they meet in bars around the city of Brussels. I'm like, bro. Edgy. Edgy. Whoa, alcohol, <laughs> dude. Like, I, this is not, this is no church of mine. Like, okay. you know, okay. this seems really weird, and like, that sounds worldly. Cause again, I was committed. I, I wanted to be all in for Jesus. I wanted the true gospel. I wanted to know what was true about, about, about the Bible and the yes. faith. So I, my options at 18 were, well, you can buy your own plane ticket back home mm-hmm. or you're going to Brussels. Mm. So we did. And this church, they, they met in like cell groups uh, every week. And then mm. once a quarter would come together for like an all church gathering. Okay. And I, at that time, the person we were staying with gave me a book that really changed my perspective on church called Pagan Christianity by a guy named Frank Viola. Yeah, he's a big I'm, church. I'm familiar. Yeah, he's a big yeah. church, uh, house church guy. Read the book, and I'm okay. Now I'm 18. I'm at the peak, you know, moment of like I'm re- I'm, I'm forming my own identity. I'm reading uh, Shane Claiborne's book for the first time, Irresistible Revolution, at 18 in Germany. I'm like, okay, this is a different way of thinking about things. Now I read this book, Pagan Christianity, which essentially says, Hey, did you know that all of our modern church, you know, things come from pagan culture, not from the Bible? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. 
this whole thing is like so messed up. And now I'm part of this church that's like rethinking how to do church. So that really radicalized me because I was like, whoa, like what is church? And that really started me thinking about, well, what is the Bible? What is the gospel? I wanted to do church the right way. That was my big emphasis then. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I don't wanna I don't want mega corporate structures. I want community. I want organic. I want I want the true, you know, gathering of believers like the Acts Church. Mm -hmm. So even at 18, 19, that became like a huge identity for me. Mm -hmm. Um that led me through my twenties okay. uh with these people, uh, this small group that we were frankly able to talk about this stuff and then just put it into practice because we ran the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a very impactful time so in my like, life. Like, like home church vibes. You can call it that. We were very clear that we were not a church. We mm -hmm. were, frankly, we were just a young, a young adult small group is what it really was. Okay. But we were not over any, there was no church over us. Yeah. So all my friends went to different churches on Sunday morning. We would meet on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. we would, and we, we said, hey, we're all young. We have a lot of time. Let's live like the Acts Church. Let's just hang out all the time. And we did. Like mm -hmm. for five years, mm -hmm. I saw these people multiple times a week, whether it was movies or or a bible study at starbucks like i lived this stuff reading all i could thinking about how do we change the church from event center to community centered mm -hmm. so this has been part of my journey really my whole life mm -hmm. all rooted in trying to be more faithful to jesus mm -hmm. and trying to love my neighbor as myself that's cool yeah i think i remember the pagan christianity movement um and i was like man this is this is so interesting because we were probably what you would call emergent, yeah. emerging mm -hmm. church, right? Because there's always that like distinction, and then there's all that hope, that big yes, rift yes. within the emer emerging kind of became the <laughs> reformed and restless, right? And then emergent kind of became progressive Christianity. Yeah, if you like will. Ryan McLaren, folks like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, and so I remember the 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 pagan Christianity thing, and there, and, and this push. My, my my thought with that was. There's so many things from our culture that are hybrids of both paganism and Christian tradition. Right. Right. So this idea that like, oh, you know, it, it, it's funny because the folks who point to that usually will slide into what you're describing, which is like, let's do home church, which I'm like, cool, I'm, home church is cool. Right. Or they'll slide into like Hebrew Israel roots, mm. like, you know, it, like Christianity is bad, and, and we got to go back to the original, and so you, you'll get a lot of uh, Hebrew Israelites and those types of folks, and they okay. want to—they become literal Sabbath keepers. You shouldn't meet on Sunday. You should meet on Saturday, sure. right? And I think that the tough part with that specifically is this: is, is it kind of comes down to a genetic fallacy. It's like just because something in its origin, yeah. Uh, what had these things, and I I'm going through a series of, David Gazek's doing a great series on church history, hmm. and he talks about how the church couldn't meet in buildings, but the moment they could, they definitely got into buildings, right, right, and under, into the in the Roman uh, uh, Empire, they did, yeah. they got into buildings, and so I think some of this stuff is really interesting in terms of like, Oh, you know, the pulpit is like pagan or the <laughs> right, stage exactly. is like it's like, yeah. but like Gothic so, architecture wanted to create the atmosphere yeah. of like meeting the divine. It's intentionally yeah. manipulative, you know. Yeah, exactly. But it's like so is the day Monday. Right. <laughs> so are wedding rings. Right, right. <laughs> like all of it is all of it has bizarre pagan roots, you know, and so and totally. then people will then go down to the to the we don't do Christmas no more. We don't yes, do. Yes. We don't do any holidays. We right. don't do birthdays because birthdays are pa are pagan, right? Right. So I think that's some of the the part and and that I remember going through, and I just was like, what? Like, as a technology guy, I think my opinion is let's utilize everything we can to our advantage. Sure. You know, and if there's evidence of the church in scripture and in history gathering on the first day of the month, or excuse me, the first day of the week to have. Ecclesia and to sing hymns. Now maybe it looked different. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe Peter wasn't getting up and doing a three point thirty minute sermon. <laughs> right. Okay, respect. Fair right, enough. Right? right. Right. But there seems to have been something to cor this corporate gathering and then doing life with yes. each other. You yes. Know? Yes, um, I totally agree with you on yeah. that, and 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 I think I think about it in a more nuanced way now for sure. Uh -huh. uh, at nineteen, um, I'm listening simultaneously to Paul Washer sermons, which is you know his really his, oh dude, Come I'm telling on, you, bro. like I was I, you're an enigma, bro. I I <laughs> looking back, I realized how weird it was because at the, here's what I'm reading at the same time. Uh -huh. I'm reading Rob Bell, Love Wins. Okay. I'm listening to Paul Washer sermons. Okay. okay. I'm reading Shane Claiborne. Okay. And I'm reading Frank Viola. Okay. And it's all it's all and, and, and at the time uh -huh. I don't see a contradiction between any of it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah. Paul Washer is like, do you know if you're really saved? Like, right. do you really trust Jesus? Yeah. Great. Shane's like, hey, if we trust Jesus, we should be thinking about social issues. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Rob Rob Bell's like, hey, if God is so loving, does God get what what God always wants? Mm -hmm. 
oh, that's a th- that's that's provocative. Mm-hmm. And then Frank Viola is like, hey, let's go back to the Bible. Mm-hmm. Let's just do church without any of this pagan nonsense. Mm-hmm. So for me, there wasn't a contradiction of like, mm-hmm. oh, these things are at odds with each other. Yeah. So that was that was what I was steeped in, mm-hmm. and it it shifted a lot of my perspectives. Got you. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I can get to like when things started to really shift for me that led me to, I guess, a more progressive space. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but the, it's up to I, you. Yeah, I was curious, like, yeah. So how do we? How do you go from this kind of? You have this very wide palette for consumption. Yeah, of, you, yeah. Just, you just mentioned four very different <laughs> totally. polar opposite exchanges, and 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 I I wasn't there, but I I think the most I was there would I, I would listen. These people are gonna think they're gonna they're gonna tear this up, but I remember listening to Paul Washer and being yeah. so sad and depressed. And then, like, having to throw on, like, some Joel Olstein to counter it. You <laughs> I'm going to tear you up for that one. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. And so, because he's just, he's, you know, Joel's so encouraging. Like, he's just such a yes. sweet guy. Yeah. And every it, day's a Friday. Every day's a Friday. Thanks, Joel. He's so sweet. But I do remember, uh, I do remember having, you know, even now, like, I, I listen to, I love Dr. Tony Evans. Oh, you know, mm-hmm. I listen to, like, a lot of Dr. Tony Evans. And then I'll listen to some Francis Chan. And I, I I tend, I feel like I have a fairly wide palette, but you had a very wide palette in terms yeah. of some of this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so how do you go from that to kind of where you are now, which is you in your theology? What I appreciate about you is that I and you had a really good debate with honest, honest youth pastor. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you guys talked about you still kind of holding to the core essentials of the faith, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Um, the scriptures inspired, though we pr- you probably disagree on what you mean by in there in- inspired, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Probably some discretion there. Right. Um, uh, you, you, you hold to some of these essentials, but then other things, uh, you're LGBTQ affirming. Yep. Uh, you tend to have more of a center left approach to social issues. I think that that is fair to say. Yeah. Um what what are some other like things that that like kind of don't all of a sudden in evangelical circles you're considered you're considered anathema yeah, to some people. Yeah, I, I guess I mean I guess more of my politics would line up with a more like left, you know, moderate left approach. Uh-huh. Um, when it comes to things like affordable health care, like why can't we get affordable health care in this country? I mean, we're the world's richest country. It makes no sense. Mm-hmm. So, you know, most of those takes are political, but there definitely are some theological takes that I think would throw me outside of like what many current evangelical Americans would say is not orthodox. And that's really because, in sure. my opinion, that term has is always being redefined by whoever essentially claims to be the gatekeepers of said faith. Okay. So um, what would be some things that you would say today— you hold that are outside the lines of what the evangelicals will call orthodox. Well, it's tough because— Outside of the political stuff. Yeah, we can get in that stuff later. And that's totally fair. I, yeah. I, what's tough, and I don't mean to be coy, is that the term evangelical is so slippery. Sure. It, so maybe the people I have in my head who would tell me I'm not really a Christian are the people that you have in your head, and you'd be like, oh, no, I agree with you. Like Their take is terrible. But, like, for example, honest youth pastor, right? Someone okay. I engage with, we've had many great conversations. <laughs> I, I Honestly, I he, he doesn't dehumanize. I respect mm-hmm. that for, uh, mm-hmm. about him. Mm-hmm. Um, but he would say that even though I hold to um, really pretty typical like creedal beliefs, you know, the Trinity, physical resurrection, et cetera, mm-hmm. because I'm queer affirming, I'm not really a true Christian. So mm-hmm. for people like that, just because I, I would say, hey, I, I've changed my mind on, sure. on queer inclusivity, sure. I'm somehow automatically outside the faith, which really means they've created another orthodoxy because mm-hmm. – Hate to say it, in the creeds, sexuality is not a thing. Mm-hmm. Neither is eternal conscious torment, mm-hmm. right? Eternal hell is not a, a creedal belief. Mm-hmm. But if I say, hey, I'm really torn between maybe annihilationism or maybe even universal universal reconciliation, mm-hmm. suddenly for those people, again, go back to Rob Bell, right? Mm-hmm. Rob Bell just asks the question, mm-hmm. Does God get what God always wants? Maybe someone can be reconciled after they die back mm-hmm. to Christ. Mm-hmm. John Piper goes, farewell, Rob Bell, mm-hmm. right? So like— all because Rob has a different take on hell, which we many of us now know mm-hmm. historically has been wild, widely debated in the Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. Many Christians are universalists. Mm-hmm. Many believe in annihilationism. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of that uh, now for me is just like, wait, I think, summing it up, I was taught that, hey, here's the Christian tradition. It's all we're giving you. Mm-hmm. There's nothing outside of the sliver of the pie. Mm. And I think the more I've read, the more I've listened, the more I'm like, ooh, this Christian tradition is way bigger mm-hmm. than this little slice of white evangelical American Christianity. Yeah. And that and there's room for I'm not saying that people who are in those spaces aren't Christian. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying why is your box so small? Like hey, the Eastern Orthodox Church exists whether you realize it or not. Mm-hmm. They are a Christian church. Mm-hmm. We split from them. Mm-hmm. They have radically different beliefs about a lot of things. They even have their own Bible, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But they're Christian. Mm-hmm. So for me it's more about like why do why am I being 
you know, kicked out for the things that are not yeah, really I, a big deal. And what I don't, what I don't want to do, and my audience will hate me for it, is I don't like to pontificate about who is and isn't saved. Same. Like I just, I don't think that's helpful. Uh, I do hold to like, I believe that if God started a work in you, generally speaking, you will land in a in a place that's most aligned with God's kind of design for things, right? Um, but I don't like to go, well, this person, you know, right now the Trinity is super hot and there's some folks who are, they believe Jesus is God, but they don't believe Jesus is God eternal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this like need of like, you need to you need to say that they're that's damnable heresy if you don't believe Jesus is God eternal, yeah. right? He's from he's from the Father in eternity. It's it's real weird, like when you get into it, right? Yeah. And, and it's and they'll point to they'll point to uh, different church history and but, but anyway, I think Jesus is fairly eternal. Like if you read Revelation, there's multiple times where Jesus says, "I am the beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and Omega." I think this is in four times in Revelation. Uh, if He's saying he's the beginning. I don't know how something that who is the beginning can have a beginning. Yeah. Right. So for that reason, I think it's fair to say Jesus is eternal, co eternal okay. God. Right. Sure. Um, but I, I hear you. And so, like, anyway, there's this, there's like, there's, there's this need to like, we want our pound of flesh and, or, or Catholics. Like, I'm gonna have a lot of Catholic friends, right? Um, uh, Lila Thomas, uh, excuse me, Lila Rose, who I'm gonna be on her podcast Friday, Trent mm -hmm. Horn. Uh, I like pints with acquaintance, though. I've never done anything with him. So I got a lot of Catholic friends, but there's this like need of like, you need to condemn them to hell because they're not saved. I'm like, right. wait a minute, like let's right. let's slow down, right? So what I don't want to do is get into um whether or not I think you're saved, right? Or why I think you're a Christian. I just don't think that's a helpful conversation. Right. Nor does what I think really matter in the in the conversation. Now, right. what what I do think is interesting though, is so you brought up the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah. I grew up Armenian apostolic, which okay. is from the oriental arm of the church, right? Okay. So the the first Schism, I believe, was the Assyrian Church of the East, and then, th or the West. Anyway, the, the Assyrian Church split first. Then, around the year 460, is when you had the first schism, which was the Oriental arm of the church. That's Coptics, mm -hmm. the Ethiopians, the Armenians, the other Ass Assyrian churches, and they split based on the, which was probably a language barrier. Was Jesus of two natures? Or from two nature, it's some some like minor word. I don't I don't remember right now. So, church history buffs will probably hate me for it. <laughs> right. Of two with two natures, of two natures, from two some 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 minor like distinctions. So they yeah. split, uh, and so that's where. So I come in that. I, I grew up in that stream. Got it. And then obviously the big schism, the great schism of what is it, ten fifty, uh, yeah. Eastern Orthodox splits from that right, and then you have the Protestant Reformation, fifteen hundred. Yep. And then it, it seems like the Catholic Church after the fact started. Uh, with with papal infallibility, like 1700s. Um, so anyway, I, I say all that to say there's been multiple splits. But but here's what I'm curious about is like, if we look at all of those churches, yes, they have different canons, fair enough, right? But they do all seem to universally agree on the essentials of the faith, like the close-handed doctrines of the faith, the Trinity, the Bible's the inspired word of God, like those things, right? The virgin birth, all those things they seem to hold to. But maybe not in an official uh, creed uh, of sexuality, but they also do seem to all, no, not seem, they do all hold to a Christian sex ethic, right? And so in Armenian apostolic, in Ethiopia, I don't know if you have any Ethiopian Orthodox friends, but I got a lot of Ethiopians that I'm friendly with. It's unanimous. Like there's no, uh, there's no, there's no uh, room for affirming theology in that arm. There's no room for you, you travel internationally. You go to Israel. You go to these other parts, right? There's, there's not a lot of room for uh, the LGBTQ affirming stuff, right? And so I think sometimes this gets backdoored as like this is exclusively a white evangelical issue, and I go, no, it's not. This is a Christian issue. Now, whether or not we put that, this is a mandatory orthodox, you have to believe that, or just tradition, the historical tradition based on sure. everything from Thomas Aquinas to natural law. Um, but it does seem like this isn't, like when it comes to the queer stuff, we could talk about hell later. It does seem like there's a pretty solid consensus on like these essential tenets of Christianity that are fairly universal across all the major arms of the church. Would you agree with that, or would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not the church historian. I think that I think that's a fair statement to say. You know, sure. I'm not someone who's trying to rewrite like the reality of the situation. Yeah. You know, I think this is where my more Protestant, maybe even roots, kind of kick in, where it's like, 
when when has that ever stopped Protestants from doing what they want to do? That's fair. Um, I mean, one, one example of this, if yeah. you don't mind, would be you know like the Catholic Church, right? They don't affirm birth control. Mm-hmm. Most Protestants, in fact, the Church historically up until the 20th century, early Mm -hmm. 1900s, Mm -hmm. even Protestants Mm -hmm. condemn birth control. Martin Mm -hmm. Luther said someone, a man who, you know, spills his seed, so to speak, it's worse than than committing incest. That's mm-hmm. what he says mm-hmm. in one of his writings. That's crazy. Most problems, Martin Luther was on one though. He has some weird but, things about the Jays. Uh, oh, hey, you know? for sure. <laughs> but, but I love that, Martin Luther. But that's but, yeah. my point though. Yeah, 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 is yeah, like sure. we're always renegotiating our relationship to the faith. Yep. And and regardless of what people want to admit, yep. the reality is that culture, historical context mm-hmm. does like we saw, like like we just talked about with the pagan Christianity mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Culture does affect how we see the world, yeah. right? So what I'm not saying is like, oh, um, I think that 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 the global church in every single capacity uh, needs to assimilate to me. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is just because I'm queer affirming should not automatically kick me out of a, of a tradition that mm-hmm. has changed on some serious things that mm-hmm. were seen as universal realities, like mm-hmm. birth control, for example. Yeah. Now most Protestants, in fact, I mean, we can think about, about evangelicals who have written books about how important it is to use, use birth control mm-hmm. and how sex is all about pleasure, even though technically speaking, biblically speaking, sex is about a man having sex to a woman mm-hmm. to claim her. I mean, this is Jen Bird, uh, Jen Bird scholarship here. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's fair, yeah. but that doesn't really deter me from like, you know, thinking about, well, how do we navigate this in our cultural moment? Sure. Well, it, it, I, I absolutely can see the point that Protestants protested <laughs> and kept protesting and right. kept protesting, and, kept protesting. <laughs> and so you have, I want to say 300 denominations in, in America, 40, yeah. 40,000 Something like that. Yeah. Worldwide. Yeah, it's a lot. Sometimes people conflate those numbers, but yeah, 300 yeah, right. in America. Um, so yeah, I, I can see that point. I, I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll say two things. One, I think, it's, I think it's pre-Protestant. I think the view of sex ethic is pre-Protestant. Now, we do have some differences, uh, but I would say those are categorically different. Like, I would say me and my Catholic friends talking about sex and Trent Horn going, anytime you lay down with your wife, you got to be willing and ready to have a baby. Right. Like I'll go, that's we could me and him and we, me, me and him had the conversation on that, by the way. Um, that's a Catholic position, right? Like every time Well, and it was Protestant. And, and and it was Protestant. But I would say any so that so that view, right, I think is categorically different than saying a man and a man can be in a covenantal relationship in the same way that a man and a woman could be in a covenant relationship. I think that's cut like that's ca- that's a categorical error. Well, you so I think this is the important distinction here. Mm-hmm. Um there's there's almost two sides to this discussion, right? Okay. There is there is how how does the church look at those kinds of relationships, mm-hmm. right? Based on whatever tradition they're part of, mm-hmm. and then how how does a society treat those people, True. right? And so right now in our cultural moment in 2023, mm-hmm. the take from many conservative evangelical Christians who do hold a lot of political power Mm -hmm. is that, hey, um, those people should not have the legal right to Mm -hmm. be in a relationship that we we can call a marriage in America. Um, These people should not have the right to exist the same way that heterosexual couples have. So that's one side of the argument to which I say, I don't care about what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Those people have a right to exist in a pluralistic society that is not a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even concerned about- Christian influence. Can we say Christian influence? I would say maybe Christian influence to a degree. And I would uh, agree. And I would agree with pluralism. Yeah, our Constitution does not mention Jesus or God anywhere yeah. on purpose, and yeah. now I'm quoting well, Andrew Seidel's work. You want to, you know, you're Doug Wilson, and you want to add an amendment <laughs> and throw in yeah. Jesus as Lord as God. the which, which amendment would that well, be? How I, many? I don't want to get triggered got? here, bro. We're having a great conversation. You got to throw Doug Wilson in the mix. Um, but so there's that conversation, okay. right? Then there is the church conversation, sure. right? And at this point, all people like myself and others are advocating for is, hey, can we just start by just acknowledging that maybe we can see these issues differently? Because the reality is, when it comes to sex and marriage, Mm -hmm. the church has had different motives for why marriages have existed. Mm -hmm. Marriages used to be about plots of land, used Mm -hmm. to be about dowries, used to be Mm -hmm. political alliances. Mm -hmm. Now we see them more as romance and love-based, which are, is by the way, a foreign concept to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I hate to break it to anyone listening out there, but Adam and Eve did not walk down an aisle in a white dress uh, and, and Eve say, I just am so in love with you. I mean, we mm. we read that into the text. So, you don't think Song of Solomon is a romance book. So, it's a please lust, don't tell me it's a lust book, it's bro. A, that's a, I mean, they are man, lust. They're getting it on. No, I'm just saying I, they're getting it on. I, they're, Thank you for not lust. saying that's not about Jesus in the church. No, come on, man. You know, because yeah. yeah, I can't. I'm not that I can't, out there. But I my my point that. is that, like, and again, I I would just cite like the scholarship work of Jen Bird on this. She wrote a whole book on on looking into what is marriage in the Bible. Sure. So I'm just making the point. Yeah. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind. I'm just saying. 
even how we look at marriage mm-hmm. between two people of a different sex, so to mm-hmm. speak, has shifted over church history. Yeah. Now, I I can see the point that folks will say, well, it's always in between two people of the opposite sex. Sure. Yeah. But at some point, any new belief is new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would say I would say obviously it's shifted. Obviously, culture has shifted. But I would also say that marriage foundationally has been about a, a couple of essential things. It's been about companionship to some degree. It's been about family and reproduction to some degree. And it's been about building a uh, a, a unit of a home, right? Whether it was working on the farm, whether it was uh, 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 passing property down, whatever. Like there's always been multiple components. So I don't think it's like that marriage has changed. I think it's always been all of those things. Uh, I, I obviously mean, there was there was times where society was way more patriarchal, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and there were times like that. But I think generally speaking, like it's there's always been a pleasure component to it. There's always been a family component to it. <laughs> pleasure for I who, mean, dude? I can't. I, can't, I, I mean, c- Sheila Gregor, she did the largest women's study in the U.S. Uh-huh. Uh, evangelical study. Mm-hmm. You know, the the orgasm gap is still is still huge between men and women. So, well, I, I'm just making. Uh, the, but but, I'm but making the to point. be to be to be to be fair, the yeah, yeah. orgasm gap is huge in hookup culture. And that sure. is very common on TikTok with women saying, "We don't even know why we hook up with random dudes because we never finish." Hey, hey, for the record, I'm I I don't know where, where that I, I'm, I'm, ju- this, I'm just saying I mean this not in a negative way, but yeah. I'm not sure hookup culture enters in the conversation. But I agree. I mean, I, yeah. I have problems with hookup 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 okay, hook culture myself. Good, 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 good. I'm not. I don't know how sexually liberated. Well, you I mean, I'm definitely. <laughs> oh, I mean, listen, I think consent's a big deal, and I think there's a layer to that. But my my whole point, just to get back to this last maybe, but but, oh, but, we, but you do know that evangelical Christians tend to be the most sexually satisfied. In I marriage. I'm aware of the studies you're okay, citing. There's you. a lot of questions I would have, but I want to be clear. I don't want to present myself as some kind of expert at something that I'm really not. So I, okay. I don't want to, you know, bullshit people, frankly, and sure. pretend that I'm talking about something that I just sure. haven't read much up on. Sure, sure, but sure. I'm aware of the studies you're talking about. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, just to maybe close this part of the conversation, I, and maybe it'd be good to explain how I even got to this position in general, because I did shift so much over the past couple of years. But ultimately, all I'm trying to say is that I think that at least in my, I'll talk personally, in the site, in the world I grew up in, mm-hmm. uh, in the church, I was presented that. The Bible has always been clear that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, four chapters into Genesis, Mm -hmm. that ethic is blown out of the water when Lamech takes two wives. Mm -hmm. Or when Jacob uh, marries two sisters and then sleeps with one of their slaves Mm -hmm. to give us the future nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. So my only point is saying that I'm not saying people can't think about this stuff, but yep. when you start thinking about maybe the rhetoric that people like me were given, mm-hmm. you need you need to go a little bit deeper than just taking someone else's statement of the Bible is clear on these things, when in reality, mm-hmm. it's not, and then we have to negotiate how we interpret those texts. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just have to. So that's kind of where Can I land say on Jesus this. Jesus was clear on these things? I don't think so. You don't think so? I mean, the, For this the, reason, the, a man will leave his mother yeah, and father. Yeah, he's talking about divorce. He's talking right. about divorce. But right? he's, so, so he's doing a but, couple of things. He's talking about divorce and combating their hardened hearts for okay. wanting to flippantly get divorced, right? Which Moses uh, permitted them okay. to do. Sure. Right? Yeah. And then he's also affirming that this is between one man and one woman. Right, he doesn't he doesn't co-sign polygamy, and so I would categorize right, but because he's he's being asked a specific a specific question about divorce. Mm-hmm. Why would he bring that up when the question was about already a man and a woman? But mm-hmm. later on in the in the same chapter, mm-hmm. he talks about eunuchs, mm-hmm. right? And he yeah, says yeah. he says those are the real people that mm-hmm. people can't accept that teaching. Mm-hmm. And even early church fathers, they mm-hmm. had to say to people, mm-hmm. stop castrating yourselves. Mm-hmm. You can't do that anymore. They actually mm-hmm. had to stop people taking those verses literally. Mm-hmm. So again, like my whole point, the only thing I'm trying to say mm-hmm. is that. We all negotiate based on on how we see the Bible. Mm-hmm. We highlight some texts as like, oh, this is definitely talking about this. Sure. We'll downplay others. Sure. But depending on the cultural moment and historical tradition we're a part of, yeah. that might shift. Genesis 4, I think it is when Onan spills his seed. Uh-huh. That is Martin Luther's almost proof text for why you know, you birth control. Exactly. Sure. Now, we would look at that and say, well, there's context. We don't see yeah. it that way. But that's my entire point. But you don't think there's a difference between descriptive passages that are talking about polygamy or descriptive passages that are sharing about atrocities happening and prescriptive language that the scriptures are using in terms of what is the ideal? Depending on what tradition you're asked, you, you ask, you're going to get different answers on what verses are those things. There are say, Christian nationalists right now, uh-huh. like Joel or okay. Doug Wilson, okay. who would cite verses in Levitical law uh-huh. that are are suddenly descriptive, or I'm sorry, prescriptive, uh-huh. while other folks would say, no, that's a terrible take. Okay. So we that's what I'm trying to say is like, I, I hear what you're saying. Mm-hmm. 
I don't even disagree. Mm-hmm. I have verses that I take as prescriptive versus mm-hmm. descriptive, mm-hmm. but we need to stop pretending that there's some unified objective truth of which ones are and which ones aren't. The Bible doesn't tell you that. Mm-hmm. We assume the Ten Commandments are still relevant to today. Mm-hmm. We ignore the laws about you know maybe eating shellfish. Mm-hmm. Even the idea of the ceremonial laws, the moral law, mm-hmm. those categories come after those texts were written. They don't say in the text, this is only ceremonial. So my whole point is just trying to say that humanity negotiates the relationship to the Bible, Mm -hmm. right? Um, It's what gives some people to say, well, when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell our possessions, he didn't mean every single rich person had to sell Mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. You're negotiating what the text says. Because if you read it plainly, you wouldn't get that impression. I I don't think so. I think there are certain things that have historically been uh, considered within the lines, right? So you, we could say, depending on a cultural moment, and you're going to like very, very, uh, I love Joel, but you're going to very specific like uh, m- like niches of Protestantism, but I'm saying like, let's just pull back and go, no, 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 what in a, in a macro sense, if we just pull back, it's, it's through church history and through what the scriptures are saying, there's, there, there seems to be a clear scripture interpreting scripture on what is within God's design for marriage and what is not within God's design for marriage. Why why is that a like why is that unreasonable? Because it hasn't been consistent. In, in which way? In, like like, in like the give, reason me, for marriage. Give, give me a time where like the we, Ethiopian we, we, church was like yay polygamy. No no no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying I'm is sa- but I'm saying historically all the arms of the church have been about a one man, one woman. Yes, I, I, I already conceded that okay. point. Okay. I, I, I said earlier, I, I totally agree, okay. right? But the reasons why a marriage is a marriage has changed. That's my whole point. That's fine. Consent, right, was not a big thing back in the day. It's not no. a big thing in the Bible. Mm-hmm. There is, there is no sense of like, um, oh yes, like I want to get married to you. Usually, the man, the little, the actual word is mm-hmm. they take, mm-hmm. and it's not wife. The word mm-hmm. is woman. There's no wife husband category. It's the same yeah. word for well, husband so had or woman. Arranged marriages back then, though. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But I'm not saying I but don't we even don't think, now, right? Well, I don't think that those are always bad. Like arranged marriage. Like in the here's here's here, let me throw you something yeah, off. I, you, I, you, I you feel you. Uh there's um two families in the same church. Kids have known each other since they were kids. Sure. 15, 16, they start dating. Yeah. Their parents are involved. 18, 19, they get married. Yeah. Fast forward decades later, they have a beautiful family. Sure. The the parents I mean, they didn't sit down and and and, and present a a a, 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 a couple of uh, a bottles of liquor. Right. You know what yes. I mean? And, 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 and a baby goat. And a baby know? goat, right? Uh, right? But that's, for all intents and purposes, an arranged marriage. Okay. And those and those marriages do work. I I yeah. Let's be let's let's agree on on the right on the right definition okay. of these terms. Yeah, because okay. because you're right. I mean, I have friends I mean, in, in India, right? Mm-hmm. Arranged marriages are still a thing, yep. and many yep. of them, as far as I know, are very successful. Yep. But I'm I have and I don't want to. I don't want to overgeneralize my sure. my understanding, but I do know uh, in particular one couple, um, you know, who their parents set them up. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, they had the final say, but they mm-hmm. were strongly encouraged by the family that hey, this could be a good fit for you. Yep. They have a great marriage. They they're now pregnant with baby number two, etc. Mm-hmm. I I think that other ways of of, of pairing people up are a thing. When mm-hmm. I hear arranged marriage, mm-hmm. I think of like. Here, you have no choice because me and the father agree that we want this thing, so mm-hmm. you two have to get married. There's no yeah. sense of maybe agency or autonomy sure. involved, you know? There's but a yeah, spectrum I mean, there. There's I mean, a listen, I, there. When, when I was dating uh, uh, girls, I trusted my mom's opinion a lot, right? And she told yeah. me, yeah. I don't know, Timmy. Yeah. I don't know about this one. Maybe I didn't see it then, but now I'm like, man, she was right, yeah, yeah. right? But that that's different than like, hey, uh, he, hey, Tim, you're going to marry this person sure. because the family has decided. Sure. I think— this is hard because in our American paradigm, romance is probably the highest on yeah, the yeah. prior, you know, the totem pole of totally. like what is valued in yeah. a, in a relationship. Where I think if you go outside of America and you look at other parts of the world, compatibility is way higher than you know romance. And so yeah. I think it's even hard to, to process like the idea of agency when in reality a lot of these situations are being orchestrated by parents. Why? Because perhaps if I'm being charitable, I don't, I don't know all the cultures, but right. perhaps because they're looking at other values than like, are you in love? Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Which yes. is like, I don't even know how, how modern of a concept that is or isn't in terms of being in love. Right. Well, and this is why I, I do try and be careful in even our own content, because mm-hmm. even though I'm technically, I guess, more progressive on some of these issues, mm-hmm. you can also end up 
being kind of colonizing to other cultures, right? You can kind of disparage them like, oh, you just don't get it because you're not as enlightened as me, the Western white man who has this more progressive view. So I try and be careful not to like get into places that I am not a part of, which is why a lot of our work is really focused on the evangelical church Mm -hmm. and really addressing queer inclusivity within that context. Mm -hmm. I would feel awkward and weird if I did a video condemning the Ethiopian church for Mm -hmm. such a take when I, that's not my background. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I mean, I I, I guess, I guess that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. I guess this is, this is, this is, this is the issue for someone like me, right. Is that it seems like there's, there's been these institutions that society and our species has been built on for thousands of years. And all of a sudden they're up for grabs and taking apart and re-examining. And I'm not talking about like, do queer people exist? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like the very fabrics of what's made societies flourish, the very fabrics of what's made families function, the very fabrics of these things are all of a sudden up for grabs and reinterpretation. And I'm saying the way it's framed, not by you always, but a lot of times is just like, these are white evangelical, white supremacy, patriarchy issues. When if we pull back and go global, like, I mean, how affirming do you think Ethiopia is towards gay people? Yeah. Like how affirming do you think Muslims are to gay people? How affirming do you think gay people are in China? Like these aren't, patriarchal white issues well, these are this is just how society well, is I mean, we, we, and we, i would say the christian yeah. nations tend to be the most empathetic towards gay people like if you look at saudi arabia and you look at nigeria you look at places that are dom- predominantly muslim yeah they tend to be a lot harsher and more strict towards this stuff are there are there christian countries out there that are ruled the same way like a i'm guessing like a sharia law in terms in terms of what like i mean I, my and again like, I like, like Ar- Ar- armenia would probably call themselves a christian nation Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. I but really don't not, know. But they're not stoning gay people. Right. But there are people <laughs> like RJ Rushduni in our society who have advocated for such a law, which is kind of my that's point kind, about that's, Christian that's nationalism. Insane, right? It's insane. But anyway, like, can I just respond to what you said sure, earlier? Sure, sure, sure. So I, I want to make just a couple of things clear. You know, I, I think that there is like this perspective. And again, I want to just zoom into what I, I do talk about. Yeah. I, I really try to stay in my own lane just because I, I want to be honest about yes. that. Right. And I, I don't want to bullshit people. Um, but you know, no one that I'm aware of is mandating that straight people get married to, you know, no one's mandating that people turn gay. Mm -hmm. It's simply saying, hey, these people exist. They have a right to flourish in in, in the nation that we live in. They have a a right to live Mm -hmm. and to be entitled to the same legal rights Mm -hmm. other people do. It's Mm -hmm. literally for me, it's just making room. Now, as far as the church goes, again, like I just go back to the same thing I've said maybe a few times now where like the church, broadly speaking, we're talking, like you said, about some big topics here. Mm -hmm has always been in flux and has always reformed and rethink things. I mean, mm-hmm. institutions have always been up for grabs. Martin Luther was 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 hunted by the Catholic Church mm-hmm. because of how anti-establishment he was, mm-hmm. right? So at some point in history, there's always someone new pushing something in some way mm-hmm. that makes an establishment frustrated or upset. Mm-hmm. That's just the human condition. Mm-hmm. So that's ultimately, I think, all I'm trying to argue for is like, do Christians like me and mm-hmm. do my friends who are gay and who want to serve Jesus and mm-hmm. follow the way of Jesus, can they be welcomed in a church, not even your church, mm-hmm. just a church, mm-hmm. without you, not person out there, mm-hmm. calling them heretics or or, or not Christian mm-hmm. or whatever? Sure. I, can we just start with like that baseline yeah. of like, hey, People exist in different ways mm-hmm. that maybe I understand or even agree with, mm-hmm. but they are still made in the Imago Dei. Mm-hmm. They have a right to exist, mm-hmm. and they have a right to faith. They yeah. have a right to faith. And at the end of the day, it's not my call or your call or anyone's call mm-hmm. who ends up in what some people might think is the good place or the bad place, yeah. right? And ultimately, what I told myself, mm-hmm. besides, I mean, there's, you know, of course, biblical things that I don't think we need to get into for now. But ultimately, I told myself, if I die and get to, and I get to see God— and God's like, hey, sorry, you were too inclusive of people. You were too loving. You were loving your neighbor in a way that was just over the top, and you just were too graceful. So you're gonna go to hell. It just is what it is. Like I made peace with that. If that's mm-hmm. if that's the take, then it is what it is. But I just don't that's, see that being a reality. Yeah, I, that's a. I mean, that's a bit. That's a bit spooky. But <laughs> this is this is how I would say. It. I think there's a difference between saying people exist, people have. Um, People have all kinds of natural proclivities towards different things, right? Um, ver- that in saying, and we're going to affirm this as something that is good towards human flourishing, towards the species reproducing, towards 
all of those things. I think that therein lies the tension. I right? don't understand that though, because like we have, you know, we know that people who are affirmed in their sexuality mm -hmm. can live healthy, human flourishing, content lives with a partner of the same sex long term. So mm -hmm. again, I'm not asking you to say yeah, yeah. that. You, I'm not even asking you to technically affirm this. Uh -huh. I'm just saying, can you recognize that people can live very healthy lives, mm -hmm. even if they're outside of what you think is the right paradigm to live by? That's all I'm asking. Yeah. So I think can 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 gay people live healthy? Is that the question? Yeah, because I feel like what you're saying is like that lifestyle. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm not trying to put words yeah. in. There. I'm just trying to, you know, sure. understand is like it doesn't lead to these things that would promote human flourishing. Okay. Like so, many so of them lead so, very healthy lives. So, so we're we're approaching this from like a utilitarian standpoint. I'm just approaching it from a human standpoint. Okay. Like so, so from a, from a, from a from a human standpoint, I think there's a difference between saying. We live in a pluralistic society. Someone should have the right to live however they want, whatever they do in the privacy of their own home, versus saying that person has to be affirmed in every aspect of that or you're a homophobe. That's where I think Christians are pushing back on, right? Like we're pointing to something that all of civilization is held to, the vast majority of the world still holds to. And and if you don't affirm, you're a homophobe. In the same way, you're saying if you if you do affirm, then you're a heretic, right? Like it's like the it's like the Spider Man. Meme. But the difference is that again, like we live in this country. Mm -hmm. Do people have the right to exist and to be seen? People, yes. Listen, people. And so have what the, I'm asking you is, yeah. let me ask you this: sure. What law, uh -huh. what law in your life has forced you to affirm queer people? There's no law. I okay. never said there was a law because so, so, I would then be systemic. Well, that's what I'm trying to say is like. Yeah. But there's definitely laws that the people are fighting right now in terms of you got to make the cake or you don't got to make the cake. You got right. right. That stuff is getting pushed up to the Supreme Court. So there's definitely totally. legal ramifications from from, an, from a government standpoint. As a civil rights issue, right? Okay, can, but, pe can people discriminate on someone's sexuality if you're in the if you're in the if you're a public business? Uh -huh. And you are open to the public. Mm -hmm. Do you have a right to discriminate against someone for? And the laws are expanded, right? They oh. say race, gender, religious orientation. I think and sure. sexuality now. Sure. And Christians, in particular, conservatives, are like no to all of these, but yes to this one. And yeah, the government, and the government, different. and most people in America are like, sorry, no, you should not be able to discriminate based on someone's sexual orientation. I, I, we, Even we, and by the way, don't forget the three hundred three creative case uh -huh. was was ruled in the in the three hundred threes. In in the plaintiffs' yeah, yeah, yeah. way, right? Yeah, because we have a conservative Supreme Court. I would say Christian nationalists, but yes, I mean I understand you think, that. You think, um, it's okay. a long, it's a whole yeah. different can of worms. But anyway, I don't know how much yeah. we're going to go on to so, this. So, but yeah. yeah, so what I what I'm saying been is, here for a while. What, what, what we haven't though. It's only been oh good. I I'll park. It's only been how long has it been? It's only been 45 minutes. Well, I don't know. You said you said, I don't know. Come There's so much man. more to talk okay. about. So this this is this is this is this is what I'm getting at. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple different things. Okay. One is the national side. Right. And, and, and the government side. Right. And I'm saying as if I'm a Christian designer, if I'm a Christian baker, if I'm a Christian, whatever, I shouldn't be held hostage to to build whatever you want me to build a lot of times because I don't want to do it. If I don't want to do something, how is that? How can you compel and force people into catering towards something that they foundationally like have an issue with? It's not like it's uh, uh, I don't want to serve a black person. Like, no, no, this is foundationally. But like, it was 60 years ago. You know that, right? Sure. Okay. So, sure. so help but me it's understand. Not the same, but, but whoa, again, whoa, whoa, whoa. Categorically, you can't, you can't do that, Sam. No, I because, can. Because, no, because black people will be like, don't, dude, don't no, no, do no, no, that. No, 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 no. We're talking about this from a Christian perspective. Okay. 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 American evangelical Christianity, mm -hmm. right? From the early days on up until 20, 2001, when Bob Jones University finally released, released the their, whole okay. interracial dating thing. That, their platform yeah. was exactly what you're saying, only insert the word black for queer. The Bible's clear. The races need to stay separate. We should not be compelled. This is why they fought the civil rights movement. They, yep. Their whole argument was uh -huh. that the government was compelling them to violate their religious conscience. Okay. Do you believe that? Let me ask you a question. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, so, so, let me ask yes, you a question. Yes, the answer is yes. I believe that. Okay, so you believe— but I believe that with this context. That that was fundamentalists and not neo evangelicals. But that was not the same the thing, dude. It's not. It's not the same thing because neo evangelicals like Billy Graham were friendly with uh, uh, Martin Luther King, and they talked about their friendship. And there was a whole backstory on that, and they've done opeds on that stuff. Uh huh. Okay. So there was a very specific stream of Christianity in, in terms of from the Protestant arm. That was a part of that. I'm they, sorry. They weren't I, against I, that. I, I, I mean Billy this. Graham was against civil Billy, rights. Billy Graham was incredibly moderate. Him and Martin Luther King had a major falling out about this. Uh -huh. Okay, my but, but was he a, was he against civil rights? Um, I think he changed his mind over time. But he was 
he was fighting his own tribe. Dude, white evangelicalism, broadly speaking, was completely segregationist. There's a book by Russell J. Hawkins, a historian, who mm -hmm. documents in the global South in the 1950s and 60s how many churches, mm -hmm. how many people were evangelical Christians fighting tooth and nail sure. to resist integrating churches based on uh -huh. their conviction that the Bible was clear. That the races are are deemed to stay separate since the beginning of sure. creation. Now you and I obviously know that is not a good take. Absolutely, okay. It's bad. But 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 is this fundamentalism or is this evangelicalism? That's evangelicalism, dude. I think that I think we're I think we're conflating categories. No. Okay. So the 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 arc is this: you have this fundamentalist explosion during the uh, the uh, evolution debate, um, the big one, 1940s, 1920s, 1940s. Yeah, fundamentalists sure. are kind of humiliated. They're like, sure. hey, we have to we have to sure. we have to resist and pull back from the world. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. we're we're fundamentalists. We have the six day creation narrative, right, whatever. Right, 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 right. Okay, then you have this evangelical movement, mm -hmm. right? That kind of starts growing, and then they merge. Mm -hmm. They merge into one. Mm -hmm. Okay, evangelicalism and fundamentalism become united together. Mm -hmm. The church growth movement, mm -hmm. uh, um, which is a huge movement back in the sixties, that gives us this idea of numbers mean something uh -huh. in church language, came from the idea that the way you grow churches the fastest is by creating homogenous, racially homogenous churches, mm -hmm. and you keep things. Separate. This is main. This is Saddleback, hold on, hold on, dude. Hold on, hold on. This Rick, is Saddleback. Let me explain. Uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you context. To, okay. Rick Warren was shaped by the church growth movement. Okay, you're okay? not speaking to your mic. Sorry, my bad. I'm getting okay. passionate. No, my good. bad. My bad. You're good. Uh, Rick Warren was shaped by the church growth movement. Okay. The church growth movement had major debates with the globe with with other evangelicals mm -hmm. in 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 the global south, mm -hmm. and they fought hard over this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just don't think that people understand how baked into the cake mm -hmm. the idea of segregation and racism yep. was into the evangelical pie. So let me just tell you the stream I come from. Go ahead. Okay. I'm if we're talking if we're talking Jesus culture, Jesus revolution, we're talking Greg Glory, we're sure. talking sure. um Miles McPherson, we're talking Mike McIntosh, we're talking Calvary Chapel, right? It, it, this is 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Billy Graham also spoke at a huge convention of those. That flow, that stream is not fundamentalist. It is not the same as what you're describing, nor was that stream anti segregation, anti interracial uh, uh, churches, anti any of this. How do I know? Because I know these Jesus people right now. I know these guys right now. They're 70, 80 years old. They've been on the podcast. These folks had uh, a diverse church back then in the 60s and 70s there were black folks coming to that church yeah right and they were for civil rights they you know and right. maybe maybe it's because these are coastal cities maybe because southern california is different maybe in the south it was different to your point i don't know but in terms of where most of us came out of the streams that most of us came out of which is the calvary chapel jesus revolution yeah. saddleback i don't know if we categorize calvary chapel as church growth i don't, I don't know how, right. we, how, 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 how we do that but sure. i'm saying i'll put billy graham there yeah I think I think there's a conflation being made that that is the same as Jerry Jones or is it, is it uh, Bob Jones? Bob Jones. And who's the other guy? There's another Jerry in there. Oh, uh, Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell. I think there's a categorical error, and they're not one in the same. I think those are very different streams of Christianity. You can have different expressions, but now, are they the fighting? Well. They, they were definitely fighting for sure. Were they, was was there conversations happening for sure? But if we're talking here and and the, the folks I personally know the, that were close with Talani Frisbee, sure. that were that were like that that circle. Yeah. Bro, that was a very diverse circle. Okay. Respectfully, right, okay. right. But you, I hear you on that. Okay, okay? I'm, I'm, but I'm not. Uh, again, I want to be clear, right? We don't want to exaggerate. Sure. I'm not saying every single white evangelical was a racist. Okay, all right. What I'm saying is that, especially more in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. right, when integration was starting to really be debated, mm -hmm. the take from a lot of evangelical leaders at the time, mm -hmm. this is a little bit before the Jesus Revolution, was the government does not have a right to compel us, mm -hmm. right, to integrate our schools and our churches. Mm -hmm. It was the idea of the government is infringing on our religious freedom, mm -hmm. right? That's the take. I'm saying that same playbook mm -hmm. of, oh, we're being attacked by, by the government for having to oh. integrate mm -hmm. is being used again, but now it's about gay people. Okay. So tell That's me this. what I'm trying to say. So tell me this. Does that make sense? Gay, gay person wants to get married. Uh, it, it, it makes sense. I understand what you're saying. I'm saying I think that there's two separate streams. Yeah. And I would, again, I would put categorize Billy Graham and I categorize those people, which by the way, fundamentalists today still hate Billy Graham. Fundamentalists today still hate Chuck Smith and still hate Greg Laurie and still yeah, hate I would right. Say that. Yeah, yeah, okay, for sure. Yeah. So, so if we're talking about the MacArthur types, right? And I'm not going to yeah, make. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm, cause, and that's a, there's a spectrum to all of this. There's okay. so many different groups. Yeah, yeah. But I would say they they don't think the Jesus Revolution was a real movement. Totally. Right. So, so I'm saying I think there's two different categories. I don't know 
where one splits and the other one begins. I, Very I, I, murky. I, don't, I don't know exactly. Was it the fifties or the seventies? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, what, what I'm fair. saying is, if I'm going to a church and the church is clearly, we believe in a Christian sex ethic. Yeah. We believe marriage is for one man, one woman. Yeah. There are people that will have and try to call the churches I've been members of, I've been a member of, and intentionally trying to see if they can get married in the church. Uh huh. Okay. What is the motivation for that? Like, besides just trying to make a fuss, right? Like, if we're in a pluralistic society, listen, man, you guys, you do you. As far as us over here, we don't believe. We believe that's sinful. We don't. We do, we're not going to participate yeah, in that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like, w what's the need to to do that? Like, what's the need to whether it's a church or whether it's someone that's clearly a Christian business owner? Uh, well, uh, okay, two things. Number one, I've. And I'm not saying what you're saying is not true. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I've never heard of that in my life. Okay, it happened at my church. I, I believe you. Okay. okay. So I don't know what their motives are. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is that legally, and as far as I know, there's no bill even being talked about that would force, force churches. churches. That's okay. Fair. Yeah, so yeah. so nonprofit but religious it, unless institutions. Unless a church is also a venue. Uh, right. Because there's a which, lot of churches that function as venues. Yeah, which the, makes the, sense. The, 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 the land is owned by the church. Yeah. There might be a venue that's publicly rentable. Right. Well, that and, and that's the key is like a business that is open to public. Trade, I guess, mm -hmm. and a nonprofit religious institution mm -hmm. are treated very differently in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, correct. And my thing that I keep on saying is that if you were going to be a public business, and listen, I don't, I want, I don't want folks to think that I am conflating the 303 creative case. I understand that was about compelled speech. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a little bit different than what we're talking about in this particular instance. Mm -hmm. But if my question, I guess, or what I would say is, if if I open up a business in in New Jersey mm -hmm. that says, hey, I am serving tacos, mm -hmm. and I say I just don't serve gay people, mm -hmm. I should not be allowed to do that based on what I think is religious conviction. And but the Supreme something... Court upheld that mm -hmm. when it came to Bob Jones and said if it comes to someone's religious conviction or someone's civil right, the government has an obligation to prioritize the civil right over that person's religious yeah. conviction. I don't think it's the same as I have a taco shop and I'm not going to serve gay people because none of these businesses are saying I'm not going to sell a gay person cake. They're saying I'm not going to make a gay wedding right. cake. That's a, that's a, that's I understand. different. Thing. I understand that. But okay. then my question is, okay, uh -huh. and I listen, I know this case, okay, uh -huh. because the, um, the uh, what's the- Which case are you talking about? The cake case? The 303 or, creative, or the, case. The creative I, case. It's the same groups that, 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 mm -hmm. that sponsor both of these. They're both Christian nationalist mm -hmm. um, lawyer defense funds. Mm -hmm. The guy who ran, uh, what's it called? The Americans Defending Freedom, I think, ADF. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the founder of that wrote a book about how the homosexual agendas can take over the country. So, like, I know, regardless of what they what, what they platformed it as a free speech issue, mm -hmm. it was motivated by the religious prejudice, which mm -hmm. is fine. They have a right to do that, I guess. But my point is, you guess, I guess they have okay. a right to do that. Okay. I just said it. Okay. My point though is that my question to you uh -huh. is, let's say let's say someone said, "Hey, I have a religious conviction about anything else, mm -hmm. like that that we know now we would never accept, like sure. like black people, for example, sure, or something sure, else, sure. or something else, sure. whatever." Would you say I support your right not to be forced to do that? I'm different in that I'm just not going to do business with them. I, you're a goober to me. Like, I, why, if I know you hold that position, why would I want to even do business with you? Mm -hmm. I would just, I'd probably roast them on the internet and tell them how stupid they are and then move on. I wouldn't try to create a legal fuss about it. Okay, so so your take pretty much is like, hey, live and let live. If a business wants it, to discriminate in that yes, way, yes. but compel speech. And we've speech. been in situations, and not, 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 not to get super woke but we've been in situations <laughs> where we've been at a restaurant uh my, my I'm, I'm with my black friends my buddy asks to get a beer uh they tell him we're not serving alcohol white couple walks up they get beers and like we've i've 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 made a fuss about that before and yeah. and bounce but i'm not i'm not calling a civil rights attorney like i'm not but if I, did, I know what time you're on but if your friends did do they have a right to do that if they want to do that, I mean, I, okay. I, I would say, I would say, I would say, if they want to do that, but most folks, I think, are reasonable enough to go. Yeah, I know what you are, and I'm just not going to do business with you. I'm out. Yeah, but you know? the right. Okay, yeah, I hear you. So I think escalating it to like now I'm going to sue you, and now I'm going to sue for discrimination. Like you really wanted that cake made. By the, I think it, it becomes it's it, it comes off, and because I, I don't want to do the appeal to motive fa fallacy, it comes off as if it's intentionally vengeful against Christians. Well, I mean that, that I'm my feelings are hurt. That you, well, my you think my lifestyle is sinful, so now I'm going to come after you and try to make your life hell. Listen, whether we like it or not, part of how you get a case to the Supreme Court is you push the boundary of something and you get up to the Supreme Court. That's what they did with Roe v. Wade. They mm -hmm. right, they they challenged the Mississippi um, rule, mm -hmm. uh, and Mississippi said, okay, go to the Supreme Court, and people did that intentionally, knowing that the court was going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. So like what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like I hear you in that, yeah, yeah. but also like just you, part of our you, legal process is you, you opened up to get the, up there. the, the ob so. abortion can of worms. Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty. Listen, I, my, my take is pretty simple. Like I'm not even looking to really debate it because yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. it's a useless debate. But I land more pro-choice, you know, at this point. But I mean, 
I don't know. I don't really have anything to say about that. I, okay. I don't, I'm not afraid of talking about it, but sure, it's sure, like sure, we, sure. there's other things that. Well, well here's, it's your here's, podcast. Here's, here's, here's your my, podcast. Here's my thoughts be, before we, we we pivot from the. I'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, on on the gay thing. I mean, <laughs> we we can come back to the gay thing if you want. But my, so gay people, yeah. Here's here is what well, because I think there's di- there's a difference between gay people and gay gay ideology. Like I think there's a is there a Christian people and Christian ideology? Are they separate? I mean, I think you could we could argue that there's definitely Christian nationalists that are trying to push the line. Are they Christian or not? Are they are they Christian? Yeah. Yeah, I would say they're Christian. Okay, great. Yeah, I yeah. mean, again, I don't, I don't I condemn it. either side, but I would say there's definitely people with specific precedent legally, and then there's people that are just like everyday people. I think most Christians would say, I don't want gay people in America to not have the right to be together. Okay. I think, I think most people would say. I mean, that. a burger fell on the no. table, bro. Just putting it out there. A burger fell on the table. That, that, that was the oh, Supreme oh, Court oh. ruling that legalized it. Many people who are powerfully funded uh-huh. by their evangelical people. Yeah. Want to, want that case back yeah. on the table? I think so. I think that the issue comes down to with gay marriage specifically is if we go back in time, Hillary, Obama, Biden, all these folks yeah. were anti-gay marriage, sure, pro civil unions, sure. That seemed like a fair compromise. Okay. Why 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 do you think it it, it went off the rails? Like, what I do you have think? No idea. Doing? I mean, okay. I mean, I I literally was when Obama was around. I was eighteen. Uh-huh. I can tell you that people change their minds on things. I'm not sure why they changed their mind. Yeah. If I don't understand why, again, I don't understand why. Once again, <laughs> man, I mean, it's just like this whole thing has been. I think we would see this differently. Mm -hmm. Where you would say that that there's some gay agenda out there that's been pushing this on people. I would say since the AIDS crisis, Mm -hmm. evangelical Christians have been the cruelest people towards the queer community. Mm -hmm. And it's documented. I mean, Jerry Falwell Sr. literally blamed 9-11 on the gays. Mm -hmm. So I I think we would see it differently there. But to me, calling it marriage or not means nothing to me as far as like me caring because it's not my relationship. I don't care if you want to call it a marriage. Call it a marriage. That's totally fine. You know why? I'm not marrying you. I think think the issue becomes is when when it's something that's not a marriage then gets to be well according to you cha- change the definition of something that throughout all of civilization all of time in all other areas is now was jacob not- married to leah and rachel is that a marriage we just, we just, you're talking about polygamy yeah wait, are I those think, marriages yeah, yeah i think that's different though well, well are those real marriages or not I, yes i think that but i think those are different marriages and i don't think god was for polygamy either I don't think God was was. I, I don't mean, think he polygamy. prophesied to Nathan uh, for David, saying, "I gave you Saul's wives, but that wasn't enough for you." So, right, right, right. I mean, but, just, but, but, but I'm saying, but, but I'm saying, there's a difference between something that is in 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 the design of what a marriage is versus something that happens and is allowed to happen. Okay, right. Anyway, so <laughs> in terms of in, in in terms of the 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 LGBTQ community, oh, okay, because um, because I, I want to come back to abortion, but the LGBTQ community, it seems like. From the data I've looked at, and I could pull it up, but you you said what was what your statement that they go on to have healthy lives? I'm saying people can like people like can any relationship. Okay, people can. But, be but I'm sure you're also familiar with the higher rates of HIV, the higher rates of domestic violence in those communities. The, and this is all CDC. I could. Pull I up literally, honestly, truthfully, because this is not like my. Um, Feel of even interest. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Okay. I I don't read it. I have not read any of those studies. Okay. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Now I'd want to look into them before I discuss them because I just the first time I'm hearing okay. about them. You know, 40, 40 to one. What? Um, uh, gay men are more likely to have HIV than straight men. Forty to one. Okay. Okay. So to say that if we're talking about it from a utilitarian standpoint, and it's like, oh well, it they they can still flourish. Statistically speaking, it's there's a lot there as a community in terms of can some of them have healthy marriages? Sure. Do do the vast majority of them, they're statistically more likely to experience a lot more trauma and a lot more heartache and and who, who are in that community. Like that, that that's just with the data. Now you could say causation versus correlation, but there's definitely numbers there. You know, I, I would literally need to look into the study okay. for I say anything. I, I could pull some up if you want. Well, I, I, I listen, I'm happy to do that, but I've never read it. I would want to go into detail, find out the context. And again, though, well, I guess the question I'm asking is so like what's the point of, of that point? Is it saying therefore we should bar them from being in relationship? Like what what does it matter? Because what what it matters is instead of society, or I wouldn't even say society, instead of specific activists trying to position a same-sex relationship as the same as a as a as a heterosexual relationship, the data just doesn't support I it. Think, they're not the same. I mean, well, people who are in that lifestyle are not the same. Well, they're obviously not the same because one's heterosexual and yeah. one's not. I'm saying as as towards but human flourishing, think, they're not the same. Okay, but regardless of all that, right? Okay. 
Um, even if that, let's just let's just take your premise as true. Let's. Let, I don't think you're sure. a disingenuous person. I don't think you're okay. lying to me. Because I got let's the say, data right here. I I totally believe okay. you. Okay, I, from the CDC. I didn't make this. The up. reason this why I'm family, on this podcast uh, on is because family. you and I are good faith dialoguers. You know? So I don't think that you're giving me like nonsense stuff. Okay, but like I said, this is the first time in my life I've heard that stat. So I just and wouldn't want to comment. But that okay? sucks that that's like you that you didn't know that there's like. Well, because this issues. is my line of work. Like, my okay. line of work is, like, we're queer affirming. We People in our spaces who are queer and want to follow Jesus, we mm -hmm. support them in that journey. Mm -hmm. It's um, My work is not, like, even necessarily activist work or... Mm -hmm. It's just not that that that's not my lane of what, I, what I'm no, reading all the that's time. Fair, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, but I guess my only point is like, if we took your premise as true, let's just say for this conversation, it is mm -hmm. like there are plenty of things in this country that are legal, even promoted mm -hmm. that like most people don't think twice about. So mm -hmm. again, like it's not affecting you. If people want to engage in a relationship that they're allowed to, mm -hmm. it's consensual. I just don't understand what what the beef is. The beef that the, is the, like, the, oh, this shouldn't be allowed. I just yeah, don't yeah, understand. No, no, that. no. The, the beef is simply. And you're not going to like this parallel, so okay. just brace for impact. I'm bracing. <laughs> the beef is simply— Why did I say yes to this? <laughs> hey, man, um, my mother is an alcoholic. Okay. I think you should be able to legally drink. I, if we went out last night, if you wanted to grab drinks, I would be like, cool, man. Like, Do you? Yeah. Right? I think the beef becomes something can be legally permissible, right? But in order to me affirm my mother in something that's destructive to her body and destructive to her relationships, right? And again, I'm not saying you can't consume high amounts of alcohol and be a functioning alcoholic. Clearly, there's people like that, right? But I would say I think it's unfair to then say, okay, well, we got to celebrate this and promote this as healthy. It, it reminds me a lot of the, the body positivity movement, healthy at every size. Like we're going to entertain something that's objectively not beneficial to human flourishing, and we're going to lie to people and tell them that they're healthy at every size, but, but, and we're going to make them the same as. Okay. That doesn't mean there can't be plus-size models. That doesn't mean you can't overeat and be fat. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with all that Uh huh. because you are an autonomous human. But when we start promoting things as the same as, as lying to people and saying you can be healthy at every size i think that's where i go stop slow down and then it becomes a legislative issue and now i got to tell my ki kids this stuff is the same as or you're going to tell my kids that's where i think people have an issue tim yeah i i wow i mean you just do so much out there um i told I, you to brace for impact. no i'm bra I'm, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm, I got the, I'm still got the ripple effect i guess all i'm trying to say to you and maybe i, I have nothing else really to add to the conversation because all those topics are just really are out of my depth um no one is compelling you to affirm anything. People make a lot of money not affirming those people. Sure. You don't have to go to a gay pride parade. You don't have to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I guess we could argue, I, I prefer not to, because again, I don't, I'm not in this world a whole lot, but the educational side of mm -hmm. this. But as two adults, mm -hmm. I just want to point out that like no one is demanding mm -hmm. on a legislative level mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. affirm any of it. Mm -hmm. All I would say, mm -hmm. if I was in charge, is like, you need to just realize that other people might affirm and celebrate this, mm -hmm. and my people might be in these kinds of relationships, mm -hmm. and they're allowed to be, mm -hmm. and you can just leave them alone. Do you That's think, what I would say to do, that. Do you think that someone that openly states, I think homosexuality is a sin, should ever that should the door ever be open for that for that person or that view to be charged with hate speech? With hate speech. With hate speech. I I don't think so. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean you're you're, so. you're consistent in that. Regard. Yeah, no, I mean because because that is some, we some have, of the we have a First Amendment. Like, it's sure. pr it's pretty broad, sure, sure, you know, sure. and like people say a lot of things that I think are terrible, right? Okay. But yeah, I don't think it should be like I don't know. I I, I would say no. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm first thought. Do no. you think that someone who, um, you, you know, some of my content like we we're very yeah, intentional and in not like not and we talked about this last night like not trying to make a bunch of like. Gay agenda videos, right? Like right. we've we're definitely not making that sort of stuff. But if someone as myself is in a public sphere and I say, I think homosexuality is a sin. I think gay people have the right to exist. I have gay friends, but uh -huh. I think that act is a sin. Do you think someone like that should in the public sphere be dismissed and categorized as a homophobe? Well, you dismissed that racist bar and mm -hmm. you said you even acknowledge that people should be able to say what they want online yeah, about yeah. them. Yeah. So yeah, man. So if so, people if you say something people don't like. In the in the market of ideas, they have a right to say. They have a right to say, but do you think that's right? Like, do you think people who hold to a traditional Christian sex ethic should be consistently dismissed as bigots and homophobes? What I'm telling you is that why I know people are going to do it. I'm saying, do you think people should do that? Do I think they should? Yeah. 
uh, it depends on the context, I guess, okay. because I mean, there's a lot of context. Uh, people, there. your community, like, your community watches this conversation. Yeah. Okay. I've repeatedly affirmed yeah. that gay people should have the right to exist. I repeatedly affirmed I don't think they should be put in jail or stoned. Yeah. Right. But I think that scripturally speaking, it is sinful. I don't think it's optimal to flourishing. I I wouldn't affirm it. Right. Yeah. And your community watches this back and goes, Ruslan is a bigoted homophobe. Yeah. Is that right? I think people might call you homophobic, and I would say I understand because those views lead to things that create homophobic ideology. Yeah, but okay. I would not, I would like not what? advocate for your dehumanization, you know, okay. um, or people calling you a, a piece of garbage or something like that. I mean, that's that's we have a very clear stance there. Why do you think there's a need to the right? The right does this, right? Like everything that's like uh, everything that's like slightly progressive is like woke and Marxist. Right. Uh, sure. And, and, and the left is like anything that's slightly anti sexual revolution, freedom is uh, homophobic, white supremacy, patriarchy. OK. Right? Like, why do you think there's a need to 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 dismiss someone as a part of a phobia? Like I, I like because if we're talking about like my wife has a phobia of animals, like a real phobia of animals. Yeah. Right. The other day she was out here grabbing something from the car the neighbor's dog was out here and my wife jumped on top of the roof of her yeah. car cuz she has a real phobia of animals yeah right so when some, when you tell somebody they're homophobic you have yeah. a phobia of homosexual people uh-huh i think it's utterly ridiculous okay like a phobia of of, of gay people would mean that i would run from them right that i wouldn't want to do life with them sure yeah, yeah. right like yeah. Or or trans or transphobic, right? Why, sure. why do you think there's these? Because if you call somebody homophobic, like boom, that's it. You're labeled. They're, they're, you're a bigot. That's it. You're labeled. Like it's in, it's intentionally meant, seemingly to discount any s meaningful dialogue and go straight for like I'm going to dismiss you as this, and now you're this forever. And I and and because you yeah, I just you, because think, you believe the Bible. I think you're asking the wrong person because I'm talking to you. Okay. <laughs> like I talk to people sure, sure, who sure. I don't agree with on this stuff all the time. Right, right, right. And the work that we do is about having good faith dialogue. Oh, dude, mm -hmm. I've been to Christian nationalist events. I've met Charlie Kirk. You know, I talk to people who I think are incredibly, incredibly problematic. I don't think you're nearly a Charlie Kirk level Thanks, person, man. I think to be clear. <laughs> but like, I'm just saying, like, I, I think that, and this is kind of maybe even the problem of like labeling like people like me progressive, because it's like, well, I'm not claiming to, nor have I ever, ever claimed to speak on behalf of like the left. Sure, sure, sure. I think some of my views definitely lean more left, mm -hmm. right? I think some of my views around queer inclusion definitely more progressive. Mm -hmm. But like, I am not someone who's like, everyone who doesn't agree with me is automatically, and I insert all these things. Mm -hmm. I try and make sure that the, I can only speak for myself. I yeah. can't, I can't, we all know comments on social media. They are what they are. Yeah. I can just say for me, I try and be very intentional with what I call people. Mm -hmm. So when I call someone a Christian nationalist, for example, mm -hmm. I have data to back up why I think that. Well, and a lot of them will. Does that make sense? Well, they'll embrace that title. Like, I don't think the Doug they Wilsons, are now. the Doug yeah. Wilsons and those guys would be like, I'm not a Christian nationalist. I think they would, they would embrace, embrace those titles. Totally. Different yeah. definitions for sure. But yeah. yeah. So I, I'm just saying that I'm not sure if you're asking the right person for that question. Okay. Like, I, I, I don't know. The That's internet fair. is its own thing. That's fair. Maybe I, cause, cause I have friends that are practicing gay. Yeah. Right. And then I have friends that are side B, yeah. which that's a whole nother sure. like those though they yeah. those they do they, the the side A's and the side B's it's do not do not get along. Right. right? And and so I, I think there's 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 so many things, but I I'm I think pe people, if I if if I may, because I feel like I have a good gauge, or at least I think I do, on the pulse of things, I think people are just tired of being like dismissed as fill in the blank phobia. You know what I mean? And, and I think it's like quick to go there instead of like engaging with a discussion. Well, I think part of why that could be difficult, and again, I'm going to fill in some of my own blanks here. Sure. And I'm, let's speak broadly, not just about you, because I think you even don't occupy the typical conservative evangelical space. But I think that for a lot of people like myself, mm -hmm. as we start reading more about American history, church history, mm -hmm. we just see patterns of consistent dehumanization towards people groups that, that evangelicalism calls the out group, mm -hmm. whether it is integration issues in the 60s and sure. 50s, or, you know, or it's Jerry Falwell Sr. saying, you know, gay people are responsible for 9-11, yeah. um, or it's people now in the limelight uh, who are more popular saying, hey, we should, you know, vote for the people who are going to overturn a, bur a burger fell. Yeah. So I think a lot of us go, well, if you can't realize that you're in a system that is dehumanizing entire people group, mm -hmm. that is homophobic, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that's necessarily even your position on those things. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the folks that we critique, the folks that we look at the mm -hmm. most. I go, yeah, you're part of a larger culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, even during the AIDS pandemic, we know now that like the Reagan administration did very little. I have uh, Bridget Eileen Rivera. She's a side B um, um, uh, queer Christian. Sorry, you got the, did you, you connect me with someone that was side B? I feel I, like. It might have been, been Bridget. Yeah. Uh, she wrote a book called Heavy Burdens. Mm -hmm. And she's someone who would say, 
gay. She's not like a militant, uh, as far as I know, like, mm-hmm. oh, if you're gay, you have to be celibate. But she herself is celibate. Yeah, yeah. And in her book, she documents, you know, personal stories in her research mm-hmm. of nurses who wouldn't treat gay people yeah, who had a, AIDS. Right. Awful. Right. So I, I'm just trying to bring up the point that, like, I think when you start looking at the bigger picture of what's mm-hmm. happening and who in the loud cultural voice behind a lot of this. Um, they're abominations. They're demonic. This is right wing media stuff. Mm-hmm. They're demonic. They, they should be put in prison. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, okay. Uh, so when I see someone be like, hey guys, I'm not like that person. As you're sharing their tweet, I'm like, bro, like, mm-hmm. do you not see like who you're platforming in this context? I, I think so I think you have to be aware of that yeah, dynamic yeah, yeah. too. I, I think it's tough with the whole platforming thing, just because if I'm if I have Joel Webin on or if I have you on. It's not an endorsement of either one of your guys' views 100%, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of overlap that me and you are going to have agreement on in terms of some of the, the goofiness that comes out of some of the right far-right spaces, right? Yeah. And then there's some things that me and Joe will agree on, on Jesus and post-millennialism, right? So I, th- I think, like, the, it, the tricky part with that, not to derail, is, like, it's so hard what is a endorsement and what is a platform and versus like what is a good faith conversation and let me understand what this person believes and how we differ yeah i mean i because there will be people that say i'm platforming you and now i'm i'm endorsing <laughs> right. new evangelicals and i'm you know what i mean yeah you know i think that is tricky in a lot of ways and i think our, at least for as an as an organization goes on our end you know we have had a posture of listen we're going to advocate for these views. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to advocate for what we just talked about. You know, I'm sure. going to advocate for certain perspectives. Sure. And I'm also going to let people know like, Hey, when it comes to deconstruction, here's some of the people that have been left behind. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I will do that and talk to that, talk to anyone about that. doesn't matter who they are. Um, yeah. usually within reason. Yeah. Um, and if, if I, if there's someone I catch online who I disagree with and mm-hmm. I feel like, like they're a good faith person, mm-hmm. I'll have them on the podcast. So I have questions. Yeah. So yeah. one example of this, if you don't mind, Go is I interviewed uh, an actual Christian nationalist who's part of a church actually local to this area. Mm-hmm. And I had him on the podcast episode, I think 16. And we talked very civilly and I let him say his stuff. And I had a lot of questions for him. But like, you know, is that a platform? Well, not really. It's more about like, hey, I'm not making this stuff up when I say people like this person really want these things in, pol- in, mm-hmm. in power, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that like, depending on how you position the conversation, sure, 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 sure. can be there. But I, yeah. as a content creator, I do think about that stuff sometimes as yeah. well. Okay, so before we move off of this, I'm I am really curious on okay. how theologically do you navigate the the gay uh, God is okay with gay, not just being gay, but gay sex and gay relations. Oh wow! So I don't want to go over all the verses. Sure. Yeah, no. But I think the most interesting one is in Romans one, and I think I know what the answer is. So, but I'm curious if you're going to go there or not. Um, Romans one. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with it, right? Uh, this is the passage I got, I got in a New King James and in the NLT, right? Uh-huh. Um, so I've heard all the arguments about, oh, you know, that wasn't about um, when it talks about gay stuff in the Bible. That was that was more so about uh, pedoph- pedophilia and not actual um, gay. gay uh, yeah, like, like uh, pedastry, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So how? Just theologically, again, and, I, and I'm not trying to go over all these verses, but I'm just curious this one, because I've never heard a good response to this one. I've heard, I started hearing a new response to this, but how do you guys navigate Rome, Romans 1? Because you believe the Bible was inspired, right? You're not one of these guys. The, God, the Bible is definitely sacred. I okay. think definitely a handshake between God and humanity in some uh, some shape or form. Yeah, but, Honestly, you, but you know, you're not like one of those guys that like dismisses Paul and goes, Paul's off. No, I, I don't think that. I, I, listen, I'm going to just warn all of your listeners now. They're going to be very disappointed in my answer. Okay. They're probably going to tell me I'm just, I'm just trying to escape the question. Sure. But there are a couple things I would say to this. Okay. Number one, first off, I am not a Bible scholar. Let's just get that okay. right out of the gate. Um, number two, um, how I view the Bible now is very different than how I was taught to view it growing up. And the bottom line for me, and again, this might not be um, a good answer for anyone, but it is the answer I really tend to, be, I, I find most convincing is like, um, again, we as Christians have negotiated how we interpret the text all over the place, mm-hmm. right? We, we would say, again, like that the people who own people use the Bible were really off on how they interpreted certain passages for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I say the same thing here is like Paul says a lot of things that we don't take literally. Mm-hmm. We don't think that men who have long hair should be ashamed of themselves. Mm-hmm. We don't mandate that we greet each other with a holy kiss. Most mm-hmm. of us would not think that Paul's take on, you know, um, 
um, on that kind of stuff, for example, off the top of my head, mm -hmm. you know, is like really applicable for today. Many people debate the women in leadership, right? You have mm -hmm. some people who are like, look, the Bible's clear. The verses are right here. Mm -hmm. Others say, well, when you get into context, and there's different arguments you can get there. Yeah. And so that's how I am, broadly speaking, with this topic. I'm like, listen, I get it, okay? I understand like what the passages say, mm -hmm. but all of us at all times are always renegotiating how we look at the Bible and what it means for our current cultural moment. Mm -hmm. So I just don't really take, frankly, the Bible's sexual ethic as like gospel, mm -hmm. because it is a fractured, as I've described many times. And even Paul, he's like, hey, the ultimate goal, singleness, celibate. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're burning in lust, I guess get married. Mm -hmm. And none of us really think that as, as like the highest ideal in our current evangelical culture. Mm -hmm. So that's honestly my take. Like I kind of even usurp all of this stuff. I'm just like, I don't think that the that that like the sexual ethic we see in the Bible is consistent. And I think that there is some flexibility with how we interpret it based on our cultural moment. Do you think that there's an objective truth in terms of how God wants morality to function, though? All morality? Yeah. Not all morality, but just sexual morality. Se sexual morality. Uh, if if you're if if the standard is based on what the Bible says, I would say no. You say no. Just read the Bible. Okay. Read the Bible in context, and you think God's cool in context? With... Don't read it. If you're, if you're reading it in context, it's even more damning. Okay. Yeah. How, how so? Well, like I said already, like Lamech takes two wives. Right. David is being prophesied by Nathaniel, uh -huh. and God literally tells him, I've given you Saul's, I think it's Saul's, wives, uh -huh. and that wasn't enough for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we can look at tons of examples, mm -hmm. people chopping off people's foreskins for crying out loud, you know, people's, all this kind of stuff. So the if you, and by biblical, I mean, read the whole thing from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get many different perspectives on what a sexual relationship is with someone. Some people who are biblical literalists and uh -huh. believe that Adam and Eve were the first two humans uh -huh. have to reconcile why, you know, inbreeding was okay then sure. to populate. Sure, right? Sure, I've sure. heard all kinds of things. Oh, well, sin wasn't as effective back then. Yeah, well, yeah, the yeah. Okay, yeah. they're not good answers. I'm sorry. Sure. Right? So I'm just trying to make the point, like, if, if you're someone out there listening to this yeah. and you're like, Adam and Eve are the first two historical people on the face of the planet uh -huh. and God ordained sex between a man and a woman for life, mm -hmm. you realize that the first two people had to break their own God ordained sexual ethic to populate the earth. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Wait, wait, you're talking about Adam and Eve having other. If if the line of thinking goes, uh -huh. Adam and Eve were the first two humans on the face of the planet uh -huh. that we all descended from. Yep. Right. Yep. And there and God set up marriage uh -huh. for one man, one woman for life. Uh -huh. Right. Yep. Um, the first generation. Already, you're you mean their have, descendants? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna got have it. problems got it, got it, right got it, got away. Got like got it, literally, okay, okay, one cycle into offspring. I got you. And you're busting up all those and rules that like God designed. Okay, I, I, I get what you're saying. Okay, I thought you were talking about Adam and Eve having other. I was like, oh, I was, I was oh lost. no, sorry okay. about that. I didn't mean to be okay. unclear. So you're talking about that. early on, you see people having multiple wives in Genesis four. That was oh, multiple wives. Was it Genesis four that you mentioned? Genesis four is lame. Yeah, 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 it's all over the place. Okay, so this is what I'm saying. This so so this it sounds like specifically with sexuality. You feel like there's no objective standard. I don't think that there's with, a one with, size fits all approach. With the with the exception of consent, I think consent's pretty important. Okay, yep, definitely. So so everything is on the table. What? Like so? This is how I view it. You tell me. You tell me what you think. When I see flee sexual immorality, that word in the Greek means pornonia, which is a junk drawer term that seems could mean anything. Anything. Yep. So this is how I view it. Okay. So I. I <laughs> I had a, I've had I've known two people that have done this right. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I think the church has fallen in 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 this category of gay people bad, gay sex bad. Okay, right. I think what the scriptures actually teach is like anything that's outside of the design, anything outside of this is, is porn and Anything is outside of God's design is porn and It is, it is not intended for it. So so I'll give you two I'll give you two two guys I know. They didn't look at porn, right? And they didn't they didn't masturbate. But what they would do to get their rocks off, okay, is they, they would lay on the carpet, on their carpet, and they would grind the carpet. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. I, until I, I have the image. Yes. Until they ejaculated yeah. on themselves. Wow, vivid. Right? And they thought that they were better off than dudes who masturbated. Yeah. Right? And, I, and, 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 and so I think when I word sexual immorality, pornonia, like I think it encompasses that too. I think it's all of it. I think it's the guy hooking up with his girlfriend. I think it's the, the couple that wants to be in a, in a polyamorous relationship. Uh -huh. I think it's the gay person who wants to sleep around. I think it's the gay person that wants to be in a marriage. I think everything is sexual, 
flee sexual morality, I think it's all of it. It's all of that. And and the church has done a bad job in like having this hierarchy of like, yeah, yeah that guy is not as bad as the guy looking at porn. The guy at porn is not as bad as the guy looking at sleeping with his girlfriend. The guy sure. sleeping with his girlfriend is not as guy as bad as cheating on his wife. The guy cheating on his wife is not as guy bad, right? Like, and I think we've created these hierarchies, and obviously there's different consequences to all these things. But I think from God's standard, God's standard is way higher than our standard. It's similar to Jesus saying, if you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery, uh -huh. right? That doesn't mean there's not grace for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's grace. Clearly Jesus does an amazing work on the cross yeah. and bodily rises from the grave. But you would you would just say, no, all, all that stuff is open? Like, you, like you can, would you concede there's a time where cheating on a spouse is, is appropriate? No. Okay, so cheating is always wrong. Well, hold, let me ask you a question really quick. So I'm on the same page. Sure. Um, you know, I'm assuming that, that you you would say that that you get this from the Bible. Is that correct? Like, like, like the, the the word porn and is no, from no. I'm the saying, Bible. does yes. the Bible inform your sexual ethic? Absolutely. Okay. So the New uh, Testament sexual. Fine. Ethic. Sure. Okay. So, um, and this is not a trick question. I'm really trying to understand here, yeah, like yeah. how you would answer this question, sure. right? There really isn't um, an exception. There isn't a reason for divorce given under like domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. You just can't find it. I mean, the the reason Jesus gives, I think, is yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. unfaithfulness is yep. the big one, right? Yep. So okay, so I mean, like, where do you get the okay? I, maybe you don't, but if if someone is being physically abused in their marriage, right, mm -hmm. and they divorce, I mean, are they then committing adultery with no. a new spouse? No. Okay. And, and, so and, and what's so, the Bible so, verse so, that you would pull that so from? So here you go. The the, the there's because we have a virtue ethic. We have a virtue ethic around this stuff. The virtue ethic would go uh, one. I would say anybody that's abusing their their wife is unfaithful, right? Two, I would say that there's a time where mercy. And there's a time where the the greater principle, one's physical harm, right, sur surpasses the, uh, the 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 practical aspect of it, right. And so we we've covered this a lot. Mike Winger's done a video on this. There's a lot of folks that have covered this in terms of why domestic abuse is grounds for divorce in a marriage. And it's it's the principle of the virtue ethic. He specifically pointed to uh, Jesus talking about David eating on the Sabbath and how there is. And uh, he's uh, David's breaking the Sabbath. No, not the Sabbath. The sacramental. Yeah, the, the, the bread. The showbread. Right, right. And so there's there's a Good there's man. a higher law, right? There's a higher law at stake in terms of the virtue ethic, and then there's the actual law. I will put lying in the same category. Generally speaking, lying is wrong, unless you're doing it to protect Jews from Nazis, right? Unless you're doing right. So so yeah, so, okay. But, you see what but, I'm but hold on, hold on. Sure, sure, sure. Why are you allowed to negotiate the text differently? to get to that conclusion about the abuse situation, but other people can't negotiate the text differently to come to the fact that for them, they don't think that the Bible is nearly as maybe emphatic or maybe mm -hmm. even shouldn't be trusted when it comes to sexual ethic mm -hmm. regarding queer inclusion or not. Because, Why can you do that and yeah, not be, them? Be, because I'm pointing back to the Bible and the and the ethic we see in the Bible, and they're pointing away from the no, Bible. No, that's not true, because I can point to how, for example, Paul, right? Uh -huh. what, circumcision uh, for, for people being in the family sure. of God. They renegotiated their faith tradition uh -huh. and go, hey, you know what? After having this council, we've determined that if uh -huh. you want to be in the family of God it's as a Gentile, a a you don't have to circumcise sure. anymore. Sure, sure. That is a appeal. That's a sex ethic, though? No, no. I'm, no. What I'm saying is you said that that, that one is looking in... Uh, How did you phrase it a second ago? What did you say? You said one is looking away from Scripture. I'm looking right. back to right. Scripture. So Paul mm -hmm. negotiates his own Scripture to come to a new conclusion mm -hmm. that a sacred tradition that mm -hmm. considers you in the family of God mm -hmm. is no longer needed mm -hmm. if you're Gentile, mm -hmm. right? So do, what I'm do, trying to say— Do you say, think me and you were Paul and, and the early church fathers? Like, I think they— they, they Oh, were, so they can negotiate? Yeah. Oh, so are they extra spiritual? Were they more inspired? Yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. Interesting. You think so Paul the priesthood of all inspired? believers is like just— Yeah, no, I think there's definitely a hierarchy for and, sure. And, and so— okay. Yes, I think Peter and so Paul get, and folks who so walk with Jesus your point, are in a whole other so category. So then why are you renegotiating the text? You're not Paul. No, 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 because I'm pointing back to the text. I'm, I'm pointing back to the text, too. Which I'm text? saying but what Paul just did. I just pointed how there's been progression in scripture from who's in uh -huh. the family of God to the yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like Bible project stuff. Tim Mackey sure, talks sure, about sure, how sure. the blessing of God starts small and goes to the ends of right. the earth, right? Okay. okay. So we can take these lines, many people have, by the way, mm -hmm. and 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 make conclusions. Again, not asking you to hold to them, mm -hmm. that might say, hey, we can see a progression of the family of God actually getting more inclusive, not mm -hmm. exclusive. But that's, for, that's a wild parallel for Gentiles coming to the faith and not needing to hold to Je Jewish ceremonial law okay. and gay people coming to the faith okay. and then being told that it's okay to continue in same-sex relationships. Okay. I, I'm fine with you saying that. Okay. I just don't see it the same way. Okay. So so w w are you saying that we have the same apostolic authority to renegotiate the faith? What I'm saying is that, like Scott McKnight would say, every generation of Christians have an obligation to pass on the Christian tradition and interpret it for their day in their way. 
And which is what we again we all do this on like, on 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 everything. No, I didn't say everything. Okay, we're on, talking about on one what? issue. On on just just on this issue right now. Well, I mean, I, like we've already demonstrated many times now. You know, the mm -hmm. Christian tradition has changed its views on a lot of things. I mean, sure. even the practice of usury. You know, um, interest, m money lending has oh, been completely oh, shifted. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm just saying, like, yeah, many things have shifted over time. Yeah. Um, but in this particular conversation of queer inclusion or not. Oh. I have no problem saying, wow, there's always been progression in some of these okay. spaces. I have no reason pushing things so, forward. So is it fair to say that you can look at the scriptures, you could acknowledge the scriptures are inspired to some degree, yeah. and just be like, meh, I disagree. Yes, like you do. But what, I, I don't, though. Like, do on you what? eat shellfish? No, come on. We know that. No, that, dude, you this, can't do yes, that. Yes, this I can, is, because no, Acts 15 no, clearly says no, it, bro. No, no, no. See, this is the trick. Acts 15, I that clearly this, says it. I, Ruslan, I love okay. you. I really do. And okay. I like you a lot. Okay. okay? And I, I am on Thank your you. show, so I want to be very respectful you. of you You know, making this happen. Appreciate right? it. Let's just start there. Okay. I, I truly appreciate you. I like you, too. All right, good. A lot. But to be clear, <laughs> you said... That the I believe that the Bible is inspired. Yes. Right? Which I do. Yes. And then you said, but some parts, meh. I said that? Oh, no, no, about your position. Right, right, right. 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 Okay, okay, okay. And what I'm saying is that every Christian tradition does that about specific verses. I, we all go, no, this wasn't for today. This was for today. No, we interpret uh -huh. this this way. We all do this. Okay. You just don't like that I do it around this particular you, you, topic. You mentioned shellfish. Okay. How about stoning women and caught in adultery? Do you believe, how about that one in Leviticus? Right above the Levitical law about uh, about killing people found in same-sex relationships. Uh -huh. Do I don't you, think people in same-sex relationships should be stoned. Oh, okay, so the there you go. You, 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 I don't think women caught in adultery should be well, stoned. Well, congratulations. You officially, okay. meh, part of the Bible. No, 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 because I'm looking at the Bible as Scripture interpreting Scripture. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Shellfish is look is, is we're looking at that in context of Acts 15, in context of Peter being told there's no such thing as an unclean but animal. But they, they were not, they're, they're all, that's only being done because you're assigning no, a value. I'm not assigning value. They're right. written the thousands Bible. of years apart. Yes. So, right, so, so, so some verses we do say, meh, because of other parts of Scripture. Again, mm -hmm. even, even that proves my point, that you will highlight, and I'm not saying it's bad, I do this too. Mm -hmm. I am guilty of this, everyone who's mm -hmm. watching on, on you know whatever you're watching. Yeah. You will take certain parts of scripture uh -huh. and say this takes priority mm -hmm. over these parts, right? But but, but we you, all but, do this. But do you understand the difference? You gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta concede that there's an actual difference in what I'm saying. What's the difference? The difference is I'm letting scripture interpret which parts we go meh to. You, you you get that, right? Are you? Absolutely. If I'm pointing you to Acts, what is it, Acts 7, where where Peter has the vision and God tells him there's no such thing as an unclean That's animal. That's not talking about actual fish, though. Let, let, let me, let sorry, me, let me finish the point. You're right, let me finish you're the right. point. My bad, my bad. I'm and, sorry, then Acts, and then Acts 15, and then the entire book of Galatians about circumcision not being a thing that we you Gentiles got to do anymore. I'm giving you three different references that go, hey, something's changing with the new covenant through Jesus. Something changed with the new covenant through Jesus. I'm pointing you to Romans 1, and you're going, eh. I don't really know. I, I, right, I, I don't really know. Okay. I have no problem admitting that. Okay. Like, I, I'm not going to be some, okay. someone's but, but guru. All I'm asking you is, do you see that? Do you see the difference? No. Why do you not see the difference? Because even your quote of Acts 15 is not talking about actual selfish. It's, we all know it's a metaphor for including people who were considered unclean in the uh -huh. family of God. Right. So that's a bad connection to my selfish reference right away. Okay. They're completely unrelated. Do you think you that, assign a connection to that? Do you think that. the Gentiles had to keep eating, show, uh, had to avoid selfish? Gentile Christians are getting saved. Do you think they were under the Mosaic law? Well, according to I, I don't think so. According to okay. Paul, right, okay. or yeah. at least some form of it. I don't know. Sure. There were some things that I think were still stipulated. The, everything, I think, everything that was repeated about sexual immorality, right, about exactly. avoiding right. idols, but, they followed into the New Testament, and then uh, the the ceremonial stuff, sure. which I think there's a clear distinction on what's ceremonial and what's moral. They sure. they didn't follow that. Again, though, I, yes, yeah, okay. I hear you. Thank you. I, I completely hear you. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, and I mean this sincerely. Maybe sure. I. Um, and not being clear as I communicate this, all I'm trying to this simple it's a very simple point. Uh -huh. All I'm trying to say is that we all negotiate how we interpret the Bible. That's all I'm, that, that's the bottom yeah. line. And I some think, people some I people think, sees other people's interpretation more problematic than others. I think okay. there are are certain things that I would concede have been negotiated through time. Okay. And I think whether it's hair, whether it's um the Catholic uh church being okay with priests having wives, and then all of a sudden in the year you know, 1,000, all of a sudden priests can't have wives, right? Like there are obviously certain things that, 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 that have changed and, and, and culture has played a role into them. But I'm, I, I think on a, on a macro scale, there are certain things that have remained steady and consistent. Okay. And I would say the morality of some of these things has remained steady and consistent when we're talking about sex ethic. That, that would be my position. I understand. You would, you would say your position is different. Yeah. On that. Yeah. I, I think and, I've, I've, I've and therefore that. It, it, it doesn't matter as much 
what Romans 1 says or whatever other verse. It doesn't matter as much to you. Well, I think I think understanding Romans 1, of course, is important to understand what Paul's trying to talk about. But yeah, mm-hmm. it doesn't really inform like how I would look at like sexual ethics. Sure. Yeah. So personally. then so then are we glean so so it sounds like this. It sounds like I'm saying, Tim, I'm genuinely trying to make an effort to let the scriptures interpret the scriptures, to look at church history and to and to hold to these things. And and it sounds like, and again, I don't want to straw man you, but it sounds like you're kind of gleaming from well, what where are we at collectively as a as a culture and as a society, and and where we are as a collective as a culture society allows us to kind of ebb and flow in how we view scripture. I I am is that, saying is that fair. I think that to a degree that is fair, and okay. I'm saying all Christians have done that. That's okay. nothing new. And your caveat will be, well, listen, Ruslan, you're missing that all Christians have done this, and it's, I would say yeah, we have done this exactly. to certain extents, but not on major things. I, yeah, and, and of course I would say I think that there have been some major things, and we disagree here. But yes, I, I think that you and I would exactly right. Yeah, I'm just saying okay. this is welcome to being a Christian. We've all done this. We we all stand on this. It's just okay. it's part of the life. Okay. Well, no, no, that, that, that's helpful because I think we have clarity on this. I think I think that that's a helpful clarity where, I you know, and and I guess that then that would go back to like how important do we view the scriptures how inspired are they is the message inerrant and it's been preserved is it not inerrant how does someone get saved what about other faiths all the, all those different things totally right? yeah in this podcast we talked about every single hot topic issue going on in culture today and as you can imagine we said a lot of things that would get us ethered in the YouTube algorithm and probably violated a couple of community guidelines so if you're the type of person that wants to see the full uncensored four and a half hour long version of this conversation sign up on patreon for as little as five dollars a month to get access to all of our podcasts that there's uh, a growing number i believe there's a, a group of over five thousand folks from in the, in the uk that want to detransition and that there's lawsuits sprouting up all over try and go to the data and we have a lot of data that people who do transition do not regret it that's at 70 percent of americans Though they don't want to overturn Roe v. Wade, yet 70% of Americans are in favor of a 12-week ban. I believe that decision should be made by the person who's pregnant, Mm -hmm. with their care team, with their family, because I can't tell you why every single person got an abortion. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. You pointed to the origins of the pro-life movement. How do you feel about the origins of the pro-choice movement? Religion to them, they they, they already had trauma in their childhood. Religion becomes a a, a vice of sorts and they go super radical and then they just swap that out and then they're doing doing other things that are selfish. I came up to my pastor said I was struggling with, with my sexuality. He called me an abomination and said never to come back. No. Hey, if you want to see the extended version of this podcast completely unedited, consider partnering with us in our online community for as little as $5 a month. In exchange, you get access to these podcasts as we stream them live before anyone else gets to see them. You get access to the replay of our daily after party streams, access to our private Discord server, access to discount codes, and so much more. So help us continue conceptualizing the gospel through media, podcasting, and YouTube, and partner with us for as little as $5 a month. Also, be sure to follow us on the Spotify podcast app, on Facebook, and on Instagram. We're constantly posting content there that I think you'll find extremely valuable. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace. Priest Provider Protector Collection is here. Priest, go out and make disciples. Provider, care for the least of these. And Protector, be bold in a world that consistently rejects Jesus. Stop being docile. Pick up some merch at blessgod.shop right now. It's only available until Sunday, so get yours now.